You're listening to the Verbatim Word Podcast, where we seek biblical truth in a daily context. I'm Justin Gary. They say you don't know what you have until it's gone. Well, all of us must be pretty experienced in losing things, whether that be losing our keys or losing our mind or losing a bet or losing the game. We're all losers, as Beck sang about us in the 1990s. When it comes to the topic of losing, it's quite interesting to look at some facts about it. The top five most commonly lost items are car or house keys, wallets, phones, TV remotes, and glasses. Maybe you've been looking for one of those recently in your own life. According to SpottyPal, the average American spends 2.5 days each year looking for lost items, and they cost U.S. households $2.7 billion annually in replacement costs. According to LostItems24.com, 56% of laptop owners misplace their laptops every month, and 12,000 laptops are lost in U.S. airports each week. In fact, the TSA estimates that 90,000 to uh, to 100,000 items are left behind at checkpoints every month. Common places to lose things include homes, public transport, schools, playgrounds, and kindergartens. In fact, when it comes to public transport, according to Uber's 2024 Lost and Found Index, people tend to lose certain things on certain days. Mondays, luggage is the most commonly lost items. On Tuesdays, it's headphones. On Wednesday, people seem to leave their wallets in Ubers. On Thursdays, they might lose jewelry. On Friday, phones. Saturday, of course, vapes when everyone's going out. And Sunday, clothing. People leave behind those coats in their Ubers. Interesting facts, but losing things is more than just an interesting, trivial thing to talk about. Sometimes we lose important things. And I'm not talking about material things. I'm talking about things that matter most, like our heart. When we look at scripture, It tells us, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. And unfortunately, we look at our life, we look at our society, we look at our own testimonies. There's times that we really lose heart. We're going to take a break from our series in the book of Acts and do a topical series for the next two weeks, looking at losing heart. Now, these recordings are actually from live teachings that I did. I've taught this a few times over the last few months in different churches, and each time it's hit home with me as well as with those who have listened. So I decided to share it with you on the podcast. We'll listen to this message in two parts, part one of Losing Heart on the Verbatim Word Podcast. I would bet to say that most of us at some point in our Christian walk and probably in the last couple of years have lost heart at one point or another where you just feel like the wind has been knocked out of you, or you feel like I don't quite have what it takes, or I'm going through the motions, or the lights are on on the dashboard, I'm going, but just something is not quite there what it used to be. I know that my wife and I personally, we just have had the wind knocked out of us. That's the term. I just feel like the wind has been knocked out of me. A lot of it's spiritual attack in the last couple of months, but just different kind of waves and seasons where it's like, are we, do we have anything to get up and to go on with this tomorrow? And it seems sometimes like uh, people are losing heart. And that's what I want to talk about tonight is losing heart. There are some indicators spiritually that people seem to be losing heart. Church leaders are losing heart. In March 2022, 42% of pastors said that they had considered leaving full-time ministry in the previous year. That's two out of five pastors had contemplated in that previous year of leaving ministry. And that number had grown a little more than a year before that. Only about 29% had considered that move. We look at statistics and church members seem to be losing heart. The average church size shrunk since the year 2000. Back then, the average church had about 137 members in the United States, and today it has about 65. Churches as a whole are losing heart. In 2019, that's before the pandemic, more churches closed in America than churches that began. Almost 4,500 churches shut their doors for good that one year, 2019, 4,500 churches. Young believers are losing heart. LifeWay did some research in 2017, and of 18 to 22-year-olds who had attended church regularly for at least least one year in high school, seven out of 10 were no longer attending within just five years of graduating high school, 70%. Christians are losing heart in the Word of God. There's a record low of 20% of Americans that said in 2022 the Bible is the literal Word of God, half of what it was at a high point in the early 1980s. And a new high of 29% say the Bible is a collection of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts recorded by man. So fewer people are are, are trusting the word of God. 
Christians are losing heart in seeing things through the eyes of faith. A recent study by Barna and Arizona Christian University show that very few in America hold what would be considered to be a wholly biblical worldview. In fact, only about 5% of Gen Xers and 2% of millennials have what would be considered to be a biblical worldview. It actually calculates to be about 4% of adults in America right now have a biblical worldview. The predominant worldview now is called syncretism, which is basically a mix and match worldview in which you take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and mix it all together. And the Barner study uh, defined it this way, a fusion of disparate ideologies, beliefs, behaviors, and principles culled from a variety of competing worldviews into a customized blend. Sounds like a nice shake or something like that, and it's kind of what it is. This syncretism, though, their survey found that about 92% of Americans surveyed had this type of worldview now, syncretism. They just pulled a little bit of this and a little bit of that and mixed it all together. What's almost more surprising, though, is that 92% of Christians, according to their survey, were syncretists, not a wholly biblical worldview. Just 6% of those who call themselves Christians has, have what would be considered a purely biblical worldview. And just 1% of Catholics held a biblical worldview. 90% of them were syncretists when their core beliefs were broken down. Well, with that in mind, it's not surprising to see another indicator that believers are losing heart. Only a minority of Christians believe that the return of Christ could come in their lifetime. About 75% of Christians believe Jesus will come back at some point. That means that one out of four Christians are not even expecting Jesus to ever return to this world. But only one out of 10 who do believe he is coming back believe it will happen in their lifetime. Little hope that he is coming back anytime soon. All encouraged? <laughs> but those are the, just the stats of people losing heart. Think of your own circles, your own observations. Think of your own heart in introspection as well. People we know personally are losing heart in their faith, in their marriages, in their ministry, in the word, growing weary or discouraged or considering giving up or shifting into a lower gear and just kind of cruising along to the end. People you know are losing heart in the promises of God that they're clinging to, not sure if they can press on for much longer or wondering if God will ever come through because they're still waiting for that. People we fellowship with or we once fellowshiped with are not sticking it out in church and in ministry. They're moving on to other things that they hope might fill them or ignite a spark that they once had. And people in this room, even tonight or watching online, may be losing heart that God will come through for them or those that they care about losing their passion or surrendering, surrendering to hopelessness or cynicism about others, the world, and Jesus and his work. Perhaps it is such a time as this that Jesus spoke of when he asked, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? You know, thinking about Easter coming up this weekend and right now Wednesday of the Passion Week, the disciples had been excited. Three years of moving and grooving, watching the kingdom of God among them, the Lord doing healing, the Lord teaching, the Lord putting the Pharisees in their place. And yet Passion Week for them was a big week of losing heart. A lot of the expectations that they had of who Jesus was and what they felt he should be doing in their life, in their world, in their society, just kind of came crumbling down. And all of them felt the wind knocked out of them. They lost heart, at least temporarily. When the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? There's a phrase repeated in the Greek a few times in the New Testament, and I want to look at that tonight, and it's the word ekakeo. In English, we say lose heart or weary. It's usually translated in the New Testament scriptures we have in English. This ekakeo, it implies to faint or to be wearied out or exhaust, uh, exhausted. And one word that comes out is utterly spiritless. And I like that last one, utterly spiritless, empty of spirit. It's the end of March. And it feels like we just celebrated Christmas, but Easter is here. And not too long ago, you drove around town, Christmas decorations all around, and those big blow-ups that people have on their front yards. Now, if you've never had a blow-up or seen one of those blow-ups up close, they're not inflatables like an inner tube where you blow it up and the air stays in. They've got a little fan on the back or on the underside, and you plug it in, and as you plug it in, then it starts to blow up, and Frosty appears on your lawn, or a big Santa Claus, or a Christmas tree, whatever you picked up at the dollar store or Walmart in the garden section. But these blow-ups will stay blown up and bring you Christmas cheer to all your friends and neighbors as long as that fan is blowing. I mentioned that we, uh, my coworker and I, we help middle schoolers and high schoolers figure out what they want to be when they grow up. And we have a, basically a warehouse of almost this size, about two thirds of this size, where we host groups coming on and off campus. And she's really into the holidays and she likes to decorate 
I do not, so I let her have at it. And so she has slowly filled that place with inflatables for every different season. It starts around fall and pumpkins start coming out and then they turn to jack-o'-lanterns and then somehow the jack-o'-lanterns turn around so they look more Thanksgiving-y to get us through that season. And then once Thanksgiving, I usually set her dates when she, I allow her to put up the next season. I give a little bit of grace, but the week before Thanksgiving, I allow her to put up the Christmas ones and it goes up and you've got the 12-foot Christmas tree and the 12-foot snowman and it looks like a winter wonderland and when the school students come in, they think, great, it's, it's Christmas in here. One of my favorite times of the day is 4 o'clock because that's when we get off work. And I get to go over, and I've heard these fans buzzing all day. There's little white noise in the background, but it kind of gets under my skin a little bit all day. At 4 o'clock, I get to go to the remote control, and I get to hit it, and suddenly it's quiet. It's silent. And all the Christmas cheer just slowly melts like the Wicked Witch of the West. And you just see this p Christmas massacre there on the ground every day at 4 p.m. All that's happened, though, from one moment to the next is the wind got knocked out of them. They're utterly spiritless. Those blow-ups no longer have any wind in their sails. In the beginning, God breathed life into us. Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. It's that song we sing sometimes, it's your breath in our lungs, and we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. And in the New Testament, Jesus sent his own disciples on after the resurrection, John 20, verse 21, after the resurrection, verses 21 and 22, he says, Jesus said to them again, peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed that life into us at the beginning of creation, after the resurrection, that breath that keeps us full and moving. But while God breathed life in us to be full, what do we do when we find ourselves deflating or deflated? Because sometimes it feels like we're in that deflating mode, maybe ever so slowly, like the low tire pressure light on a cold winter morning, not quite out, but you know you probably shouldn't be on the road, or other times just a pile of nothing, utterly spiritless as followers of Jesus, like Christmas blow-ups at 4 p.m. What does the New Testament say about not being ekakeo, of not losing heart? Well, we're going to look at four passages tonight about that. If you want to turn to Luke chapter 18, look at the first one there. First of all, we can lose heart when we stare too long at the state of the world around us. It sucks the life out of us. Turn on the news or don't, and it's overwhelming. We took some middle school counselors with us to a conference a few months back, and they got to choose the different sessions that they went out to, the breakout sessions, and afterwards we got back together and debriefed. And when they came back, some of them went to this one called self-care. It was a workshop on self-care. And the big takeaway they all got was the speaker said, give yourselves 10 minutes a day max of watching the news. That's what they told these school counselors. Don't watch more than 10 minutes a day of news. And the self-care expert said, you are damaging yourself if you stare too long to get more of that into you. Because this world can be a very discouraging place. Like Peter looking at the wind and the waves, when we stare too long at what's going on around us in this realm, in this world, we start to sink. And Jesus told a parable about it, about not losing heart. If we look at Luke 18, verse 1, it says, Then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. There's that word right there at the end of verse 1, ekakeo, to not lose heart, to be utterly spiritless. Now, if you take a look at this whole par parable, let's read the next verses. He says we shouldn't lose heart, and he gave them this example in not losing heart. There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard men. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because of this widow who troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. Then the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? This is a parable of stark contrasts. It's how much more God will listen. 
we often read this in terms of keep praying, and if you bother God enough, you'll eventually get what you want. If you pester God long enough, he will eventually give in to you, right? That's often the interpretation upon first reading people take away from this. Just keep praying, and eventually God will be sick of hearing you, and he'll give you what you're asking for. There is something about praying that does air us up like a Christian. We take our cars at the gas station to that compressor, we wait in line till it's our turn, and we fill it back up to that. And praying is like putting our lips on that compressor. I don't know if it was a Looney Tunes cartoon or something, but I have memories as a kid of seeing some cartoon character sucking on the air compressor thing and blowing themselves back up again. And that does happen a little bit when we pray. When we connect with our Heavenly Father and to the spiritual world, to the other realm that we're called, that we are citizens of, we inflate back up again through those things like prayer and worship. But losing heart is often an indicator that we need to be in the Father's presence. But if you look at Luke 18, it's actually in the context of his return. This judge, this unrighteous judge, got so sick of this widow that he said, I'm just going to give her what she wants because I'm sick of hearing her. This is a much more parable, saying how much more does a father who loves you, you're his child who's aware of your adversaries and what they've done against you. You're his children. He's protective over you. His heart covers you. How much more will he respond to you? So much more. But this is in the context, Luke 18, of his return. Luke 18 follows Luke 17. And at the time that this was written, there were no chapter breaks. It went one thing into the next, one verse into the next. And if you notice, at the end of verse 8, it says, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Well, chapter 17, the end of it, speaks of Jesus coming. So I believe this is kind of a parable tied into the next one, and then it translates and moves into the next parables. But look at it in this context if we look at that. Look back at 17, verse 20. Jesus is talking to the Pharisees when asked when the kingdom of God would come. And he told them, the Pharisees, he says it won't come with observations. It's not going to come with the signs that they thought would come with it. Their expectations of the Messiah coming into Jerusalem, taking over, walking up the steps, this political Messiah to set them free from Rome and give them this paradise on earth as the Jews that they had always longed for as his people. He said it won't come with those observations. Then it says in verse 22 through 27, now he's talking to his disciples. So he starts off the conversation talking to the religious leaders. It's not going to come the way you think. Then we see he's with his disciples, verses 22 through 37. We're going to kind of hopscotch through here. Verse 23, when people say, look here or look there, don't go after them. It's not going to be like that. Verse 24, as the lightning flashes across heaven, so also will the Son of Man be in his day. Verse 25, and he will be rejected by their generation, that generation that they were living in. Verse 28, and as in the days of Lot, they ate and drank, and the judgment came. Verse 30, even so it will be in the day the Son of Man is revealed. Verses 34 through 36, two will be in bed, one will be taken, the other left. Two will be grinding, one taken, the other left. There's an unexpected interruption of the world and their plans and their agendas. In talking about losing heart in context, Jesus was telling them that, first of all, he would come back. Don't lose heart. And second of all, they would not miss it. Don't lose heart. The Bible before the chapter breaks ties us in then because we don't see in verse, or all the way down in verse 8 of chapter 18, he's still talking about when the Son of Man comes. He will find, will he find faith on this earth? That's the context, I I think, of this parable that we read about in Luke 18. And though the world keeps growing worse, and though we may get discouraged by what we see or the apathy for the things of God around us, they were not to lose heart, and we are not to lose heart, but keep praying and waiting for God to come back and God to avenge and to bring judgment on a Christ-rejecting world. Now, we don't need to be like Peter and John who said, do you want us to call down fire from heaven, Lord? That bloodthirst of, yes, bring on the judgment. I'm saved. I'm sealed. I've got my fire insurance. Bring it on, Lord. That's not the right heart. Peter and John were rebuked with that kind of heart. But the truth is, Jesus came the first time on a donkey, humble, to save the world. The second time, he comes on a horse, to come and conquer. And when a king comes to conquer, he takes care of those who have rejected him and who are in opposition to him. And God says, don't lose heart. I will be back. The psalmist in Psalm 73, a very famous psalm, he wondered what we often wonder. How are these bozos getting away with what they're getting away with, Lord? 
why aren't you doing something? Why aren't you stepping in? And the psalmist has a change of perspective, though. In Psalm 73, verse 17, he says, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. The psalmist needed that heavenly perspective. And when he saw it through God's lens, everything made sense. And this change of perspective brought a change of heart. At the end of Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. That psalmist stepped into a place where he could clearly see once again the throne room. And everything in this earth came back to perspective, and everything that was to come came back in perspective, and even his own sense of self came back in perspective, a sinner in need of grace. The parable in Luke 18 reminds us not to lose heart, but to continue looking to Jesus and trusting him to be perfect and righteous and just and fair, regardless of the circumstances of this world that we look around and see. There's a movie out right now. We just saw it the other day. My father-in-law invited us to go, and we saw it on Saturday. It's called The Ark and the Darkness. It's a basically two-hour documentary about uh, the flood, a biblical perspective on the floods. Really, really good. I think it's playing again April 1st at uh, more, uh, the Warren Theater is in more if you're interested in seeing it, I'm sure it'll be online soon. But at one point, one point that they made that really stuck out to me was um, that the world really denies the possibility of the flood. It's just, you're almost crazy if you think that biblically there could have been a flood and that that's all legitimate or that that's uh, literal. And the point that they made in this movie is that if you can write off the flood, then you write off evidence in history of God's judgment upon the world. And if you can write off God judging the world once, then you will definitely ignore the coming judgment that the Bible speaks of. And so they were making a case as it's the spirit of the world. It wants everyone to deny the flood because if you can deny it happened once with water, you will deny that it's gonna happen again with the fire. God will avenge every adversary in his perfect timing. But now, for now, the work of the cross is available between his first coming and his second coming. And praise the Lord for that. Because if the Lord had come five years ago, or 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, or 30 years ago, if the, the Johns and the Jameses of those that say, call down the fire from heaven in those days, where would we be? It's God's kindness and his patience that leads us to repentance. Jesus has his perfect heart towards all these things. And we can lose our heart and get out of balance. We are to keep asking for the Lord to return and to come again. And in that, we will not lose heart. We're always to pray and not lose heart until then, even if it's taking longer than we anticipated. Peter wrote in his epistle, his second epistle, that scoffers would come in the last days saying, where is the promise of his coming? There are over 1,800 references in the Bible to Christ's return. There's more about the second coming of Christ than about his first coming. There's an eight to one ratio in favor of Jesus' second coming. 17 books in the Old Testament reference it. 23 of 27 books in the New Testament talk of his return. Seven out of 10 chapters in the New Testament refer to him coming back. 70% of the chapters in the New Testament talk about Jesus coming back. And one out of every 30 verses in the New Testament teach us that he is coming again. In fact, the second coming is the most dominant subject in the New Testament other than salvation. And Jesus said more than 50 times to be ready for his return. So it doesn't surprise me with so many believers losing heart. I'm amazed at how many people are changing their thoughts on the return of Jesus Christ. I'm thankful to be part of Calvary Chapel. And historically, it's a distinctive of Calvary Chapel was a premillennial, pre-tribulation view of the rapture of the church. Pastor Ken did a great job in Revelation of laying out that timeline. I think there are various views on how this might occur and all feel that they have a biblical support for what they believe. And it's not an uncompromisable truth of the gospel, but I'm amazed at how many people are changing their thoughts on this. Some people think that we maybe in Calvary Chapel overemphasize it or talk about it too much. And we do talk a lot about it because we're excited about it. I'm a teacher and I just got back this week from spring break and I'm looking very forward to summer break counting down the weeks, counting down the, down the days. 
Summer break motivates me. It gets me going through today because I know that I have an end in sight. So why am I not talking about summer break with my students every day? How many days left? How many weeks left? I've got five more days than you. All right, I can hang on for that. And we're excited together because we're looking forward to that. So why wouldn't I talk about Jesus coming back? It's better than summer break. Paul even told the Thessalonians to encourage one another with those words, the thought that Jesus is coming back. We're not to lose heart, but to keep praying and waiting and expecting and proclaiming the message of Jesus, his first coming until that second coming comes. Well, there you go. We can lose heart when we lose sight of the fact that Jesus promised us that he would come back for us. You know, scripture is full of God revealing himself to us as a God who seeks and saves that which is lost. In fact, Luke chapter 15, there's an entire chapter devoted to it. We see the parable of the lost sheep, where the 99 sheep were safe and one sheep was lost and the shepherd left the 99 to find the one that was lost. There's a parable of the lost coin, where the woman lost one of her 10 coins. She still had nine, but one was lost and she swept the whole house and put it in order until she found that one lost coin. And then there's the parable of the lost son, where the son went away in rebellious, wild living to a faraway country, but the father continually scanned the horizon, hoping that that son would return. You know, in each of those stories of things that were lost, we see a different reason for something being lost. The first with the sheep, well, it was the sheep's nature. Just by nature, that sheep was lost. And then with the coin, it was circumstances. That coin happened to be lost. The last one we see, it was by choice. Because of rebellion, that son was lost. In each of those circumstances, though they were different, God sought and saved that which was lost. You know, our hearts might have been lost. It may be different varying degrees for each one of us, but we need to keep our hearts, for out of it flows the issues of life. And we have a God that seeks that which is lost and can restore our hearts if we'll just ask him. So Lord, we ask that you'd reveal to us our hearts where they are, Lord. And for whatever reason they may be lost, whatever degree they might be lost in, Lord, we ask that you would reveal that to us and that you would show us, Lord, and that you would bring us back to finding our hearts once again. God, set our eyes upon you. May we not be distracted by the things of this world, but may we focus on you, Lord, and the things that are most important, the things that are internal. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Check back in next week for part two of Losing Heart on the Verbatim Word podcast. Have a blessed week.